All right, so as promised, we also have to figure out the minimum distance and this talk is going to explain what the minimum distance is of a gopher code. We're going to get some nice bounds on it and we're also going to see how to decode it. And well, spoiler alert, as I said in the last talk, we will not need the, um, uh, the, the matrices S and P for that. So we really can deal with the secret key just being the support and the gopher formula. All right, so as a short reminder, so the gopper code gamma of L for my G, L was the support, it was his N elements of F2 to the M, and G is the gopper polynomial, which is some square field polynomial over F2 to the M, such that none of the elements of support is a root of G. And typically we pick G to be irreducible. Now in the definition of the code, we use some S of C, there was this um, CI over a mi uh, x minus ai, the sum of those, and that should be zero mod g of x. But now we need to focus on the view of this as a polynomial, so I'm going to rename this as a polynomial s of x. So here's just the definition of what this s of x is. This is nothing but what I previously called uppercase s of the code word c, um, just now written as a polynomial. And then in order for this to be a code word, the c this s of x has to be 0 modulo g of x. Now, if we're looking for the minimum distance, we're looking for words which have very few zeros, very few ones. So we know that the minimum distance, because it's a linear code, is equal to the minimum weight of any code word which is non-zero. Let's do some more transformations of this. So well, bring everything on the same denominator. We don't know which ci's are zero, which ones are one. So we'll just do a cross multiplication of all the denominators. So that's the product from one to n of the x minus ai. And then um, the numerators will just be multiplied by, well, the rest of this product. So exactly those x minus ai, where j is not equal to the i that we have in the sum. We do know that we can invert everything, and we also, that was part of the conditions of how we show polynomial on the support. And so we know that the denominator, even this, this product of the, all the denominators, is co prime to g of x. So if this thing has to be 0 mod g of x, then we know it's the numerator, not the denominator, which achieves this. So g of x must divide this big sum ci times the products of x minus aj. Okay, so now we're going for a C which has a small weight. So in particular, let's assume that the weight would be less than the degree of G. We're trying to get a lower bound on the, uh, on the minimum weight. And so let's first assume we have an upper bound that is less than T. Okay, so those were C i is zero, which is, well, all but W of these, that means we have the, the zero times something, well, that's the only one where the, so if a c i is zero, then that the, would be the only sum where the a i is missing, but those appear with zero. So that means that every sum which actually appears because the c i is one, has those, uh, where the zero, uh, where the i is, where the <laughs> c i is zero, the a x minus a i appears everywhere. That means we can just cancel it. It appears both in the numerator and the denominator, and in the numerator it appears in every sum. So we can shorten this whole thing to, well, far fewer terms. That means that what remains are exactly those x minus a i in the denominator where the c i is 1. So the denominator becomes the product over all of those i's where c i is 1 of x minus a i. Well, c is supposed to have weight w, and that means that the denominator now has degree w. When you look at the numerator, well, we now cancelled a whole bunch of things, but we cancelled them pairwise. And the numerator always has the degree one less than the denominator. So the numerator has degree w minus one. That's exactly how many pieces we've put in there. And since it's a monic polynomial, there will not be a cancellation of the top term, so it's exactly degree w minus 1. And so we're having that the degree of the numerator, sorry, of the denominator, is w minus 1, 
and we know that the degree of g was at least w. So there was this uh, upper bound on that. So the degree of g is at least well, is equal to t, which is larger or equal to w. Huh. So if we have something which is zero, end of degree, well, degree zero modular polynomial of degree at least w, but it has degree w minus one, that means it has to be zero without the reduction modular g. So that means we're currently looking at a zero denominator. Well, that's kind of a contradiction to the degree being w minus one. And so that means we had um, the only condition which we put in was the assumption that the weight of c, the w, is less than or equal to t. So from this contradiction, we're getting that the degree must have been at least uh, the degree of g, so that the weight of c must be larger or equal to t plus 1. Okay, so at this point we have used some properties of Gopper codes, namely, well, this definition, but we haven't used anything specific over the find field or where those things are defined, so this would also hold if we would be using uh, Gopper codes over other fields than the binary field. We do use that the CIs are over the small field, that they're 0 or 1, but you can extend this also to, well, gen FP and FP to the M. But we can do better in the binary case. So we can actually improve the minimum distance over this T plus 1 that we just proved. So we're again starting with our C, we assume it has a small weight and we call this weight W. We're now redefining this polynomial denominator um, well, the denominator is always this x minus ai, but then we also know that we cancel a whole bunch of things, namely those where the ci's are zero. And now we just put those ci's in the exponents. So if the ci is zero, then, well, this is just something to the zero, so that's one. And if it's one, it appears. So this f is actually equal to the denominator which had in the previous slide. Just there it was written as the product um, over all i where the ci is non-zero. Now derivatives you do know from calculus of course, but we can also compute derivatives in a formal way for um, other fields. So we can compute these derivatives over f2 to the m. And we have the same rules, we have the chain rule, we have the product rules, and so if we compute the um, derivative of f, this thing giving us a product there, then we're getting the sum over the ci, so well, we reduce the exponent by 1. So if the exponent was 0, well, this would be 0 times something. And if it's 1, then we get this in front. And then we're getting the product after, well, exactly those other ones. So this is just using the product rule that if you have a long product, then you compute the derivative of this times the rest, derivative of this times the rest, etc. But looking at this polynomial, well, that's exactly the polynomial that we have in the numerator. I am using there that I'm reducing ci by 1, so if it was 1, it goes away. If it was 0, well, I don't want to write a minus 1 because that would be wrong, but then the ci is 0, so I would be multiplying by 0, and so this is a valid expression. And so this s of x from the previous slide can also be written as the f prime divided by f. And then the condition is that that is congruent to zero modulus g of x. As we had argued before, the f of x is co prime to g, so this being zero mod g of x means that g divides f prime. We can now dive a bit more into what derivatives actually do over the fine field f2 to the m. So if you have, if you're looking at the individual monomials in this polynomial, so if you have a monomial with an odd exponent, well, derivative rules are the same as what you know in the calculus, so you're taking the exponent of x, you're putting it in front, and you're reducing the exponent from it. So if it was an odd number, then that becomes 1 mod 2, and so you're keeping that term, you're just getting, well, whatever the coefficient this f2i plus 1 was, times 1, and then the exponent is reduced by 1, so times x to the 2i. But if you had an even exponent, so you have f2i x to the power 2i, 
then the coefficient gets multiplied by zero because well two i is zero mod two and so all the even degree terms disappear the odd degree terms lead to an even degree term in the derivative so f prime contains basically only every second term and only those which have even degree. Also, well, the degree is at least one less than it was before. So the degree of f being w has now led to the degree of f prime being at least, uh, at most, w minus 1. Now, if we assume that w is odd, then we're getting that the degree of f prime is exactly w minus 1. We also know that over f2 we have this what's often called a freshman's dream. So if you if you compute this x plus 1 squared, then yeah, we do know the binomial uh, formulas, so that there would normally be a x squared plus 2x plus 1, but 2x disappears because we're computing mod 2, so we can just take the square of a sum and apply squaring to every of the terms individually. We can also look at this the other way around. If we see an x squared plus 1, we know that we can put the square on the outside, so we're taking x squared plus 1 and moving this over to x plus 1 squared. And that's what we're going to do with our f prime here, because f prime contains only even exponents. So our f prime here, well, if we write it now so that we get exactly, well, we can show that these are even exponents, so the degree of f prime being w minus 1, w was odd, so w minus 1 is even. So having the sum from 0 till w minus 1 over 2. And then I'm only having every second exponent, so that's the x to the 2i that's left there with the matching coefficients. Now over f2 to the m, every element has a unique square root. So I can compute the square root of these coefficients f 2i plus 1. I don't know what it is, but for the argument I want to make, I can just put a square root sign over it. And so what I'm going to do now is apply this x plus 1 squared being x squared plus 1 um, the other way around. So I'm taking this thing which, well, has to be a square because only even exponents appear and putting the square on the outside of the parentheses. And that's what's happening um, in this step here. So we're getting um, away from the degree, I mean, we're getting the degree half, basically, and then the square on the outside. So we know that this f prime is the square of some polynomial capital F of x. And now we come to the point where I need that g is square-free, namely, if g, well, this f prime is supposed to be congruent to 0 mod g, so also f square, capital F square, has to be 0 mod g, but since g is square free, this also means that g itself divides f, not just f squared. And so that means that f has to have degree larger than what the degree of g is. So I'm getting a nicer bound on the minimum distance here, namely that the 2t, that the, well, g has degree t, so the minimum distance, distance is at least 2t plus 1. The plus 1 comes from the degree of f prime being one less than w, and so w is, well, one more than two times t. Right, this is a lower bound. We don't actually know exactly what the Gopper code has, but this is a nice lower bound that we will be using for our estimations. So we can always hope that you have a better bound, but 2t plus 1 is good enough. So finally, um, how do you decode such a code? The only thing we've seen so far is, is Hamming codes where I said, well, you can search for your syndrome and then you hope to find it, but that of course only helps if you have just one error. And here, well, if the minimum distance is 2t plus 1, then we can correct t errors. And typically we're going to choose t much, much larger. Remember the original parameters from McNeese had t being 50, so we need to be able to efficiently um, correct 50 errors on this. And nowadays, well, we're even having something like 112, 113 errors. Okay, so now the third name for the same polynomial. So we've been using c of uh, s of c, s of x, f of x, 
And now in the decoding algorithms, we typically call this thing sigma. Um, I'm giving it a new name because it is written in a slightly different form. But this is going to be exactly the same polynomial that we have now seen on the previous slides. So this is called the error locator polynomial, and it's the product over the x minus ai, exactly those ai included where the, um, the error vector is non-zero. Well, we had this for c rather than for e. Um, this is a syndrome decoding algorithm, so we can't actually retrieve c, we can only ever retrieve e. But then, well, that is also what matters in the Niederreiter system, and also what matters in syndrome decoding, so you want to get the e. Okay, so this is similar to um, the polynomial that we had before in the denominator, except for this time, well, it's an error, so it has weight smaller than the minimum distance. So we can correct up to t errors for guarantee, and so this is typically going to have t terms. And that's another reason for giving it a new name. Now, if someone magically gave us the sigma of x, this error locator polynomial, then we can recover all the error positions by just factoring it. So say this is a degree 50 polynomial, and if we factor this into linear parts, I mean, all of those are defined over this f2 to the n, then we just find exactly the ai's as roots in those positions where there's an error. And then we remember what our L support was like, where this ai is sitting, and then we know it's a position in those, it's an error in the position i. Now we're going to do some more magic of uh, find fields and derivatives and what have you not. So we're going to split our sigma into odd and even terms. That we can do. So we're calling the even term part A and the odd term part B. And we're using the same trick as on the previous slide to um, put the square on the outside of those terms. So if we take the even degree terms, then we group them and we put the square on the outside. So the A, the capital A there, is actually the square root of the sum of the even terms, and the b there is the square root of the sum of the odd terms, well, the x put on the outside. Knowing that this is the same as the f on the previous slide, we also know that the s of x, the syndrome polynomial, um, can be written as sigma prime divided by sigma, and that the sigma prime includes just the odd terms. And well, okay, now we have written it there, the x disappears in the derivative, so sigma prime is just b squared. And now we're just going to do some fairly simple rearrangement. So if we know that sigma prime is equal to b squared and s is equal to sigma prime divided by sigma, then we're well, removing the uh, sigma on the other side, so we're getting um, sigma times s is equal to sigma prime, which is equal to b squared. And then we're expanding the sigma again into the a squared plus b squared at x times b squared, and so that gives us the first equation there. And then we're sorting everything uh, by the multiples of b squared and by the multiples of a squared. So we're getting that b squared times x plus 1 over s of x is equal to a squared. Now the a squared and the b squared, well, we don't know those. If we had them, then we would be having sigma. Um, but the part that b squared is multiplied, this x plus 1 over s of x, the s of x we can actually compute. That is the syndrome polynomial. That is taking the syndrome that we have and, well, putting, computing it mod x, uh, as a polynomial in x. And so we know it's non-zero, and so it has some degree t that we, well, find the errors in. Okay, so taking the square root of everything, again, over binary field square roots are unique, so we're getting that the a is equal to b times the square root of this term there, so there's a b that I introduced, and then this is an application of continued fractions, which you may or may not have seen. If you have seen it, then okay, you know how to get a and b from v and g, um, if you don't know, well, I'm going to give a, a short explanation using the, well, assumption that you know how to compute extended Euclidean algorithm steps. Also note that v of x we can compute with the public values. So this is um, 
well, x plus 1 over x, this is where the continued fraction comes in, but it's computed modulo g of x. So we can, well, take those elements and compute everything modulo of x. And then um, when you do a GCD computation, so we're inputting v and g, computing the GCD, then we're starting by taking, so the, the part where the a is sitting there, that will always be a valid linear combination of some multiple of v and some multiple of g. But we're starting with trivial com combinations. We're saying that 1 times g is g, or 1 times v is v. And then we start combining those. And then what happens is that the degrees of the parts in front of the g and the v increases, and the degree on the a part, so on the left-hand side here, goes down. And so when you're doing a full GCD computation, well, we know that G is well, typically is, is reducible. So we know that if you're going all the way to the GCD, then the A of X is going to be 1. And the degree of this position B there is going to be at most the degree of G minus 1. And the part of H is going to be the degree of V, well, 1 less than that. But if we stop halfway where those are balanced, so A is going down in degree, and b is going up in degree, and we're stopping when the degree of a is t minus uh, t over 2, and the degree of b is about t minus uh, t over 2. Um, well, I put the correct values on the slides there. This comes from knowing that the sigma has degree t, and we have split it into the odd and the even terms. So if it's, say, if, if t is even, then the first, uh, so the highest degree term is going to be in the a, if the degree of sigma. So if t is odd, then the highest term is going to be in the x times v squared. And so, well, the x goes away. That's why there's a t minus 1. Okay, so that's a, well, you have seen the extended Euclidean algorithm, so this is a fairly simple algorithm to implement. You just need to know when to stop and then just, well, watch your, your degrees increase, decrease, and um, you're getting the a and the b. Once you have the a and the b, you can square the a, you can square the b multiplied by x, so you're getting your sigma, and then you're back to where I said at the beginning. If we had the sigma, then we could just factor it and get the positions. So this is how you decode a GOPA code without knowing anything about the matrix. So we do not need to store the public key matrix, matrix in order to be able to decode it. We only need to remember the order and support because, well, that will tell us where this AI is sitting once we figure out AI is the root of, uh, of the polynomial of sigma. And we need to have G, of course.